Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you for joining the Cancer Bio Summer School and Cancer IO Seminar. It is the fifth and so far final seminar in the series, and we're happy to host you today uh, from all over the world again. Uh, I'm Heidi Haikala from Cancer IO and University of Helsinki, and we also have here uh, two of the main organizers from the summer school, Mariel Savelius and Krista Tuohinto. And then we also have Professor Juha Klefström from the, from the university as well. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we get uh, started. So the seminar will be recorded, as you noticed, and uploaded uh, later into the Cantrio YouTube and web pages. Uh, and you can send questions throughout the session using the QA function. Do not use the chat function because that's how you can re reach us, uh, us hosts. Um, or you can email uh, cancerio-office at helsinki.fi. And University of Helsinki students can again get credits by signing up in WebAudi or whatever is the system, CISO nowadays, sorry, I'm old, um, and sending us a half a page summary of what they have learned during the session. I really hope that we all learn a lot from Professor Hanahan today. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Juha Klefström now uh, for the introduction. All right, uh, hello everybody and, 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 and thanks very much, uh, Doug, for, for uh, uh, kind of uh, joining this uh, seminar, giving a talk here. And uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, uh, Dr. Hanan is a, is a, is a distinguished uh, scholar of the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, and is a professor of molecular uh, oncology of the Swiss Institute for Experimental Cancer uh, Research, ISREC, EPFL. Uh, and he was trained uh, at MIT and Harvard University, and he was working at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, and, and then later on, uh, 20 years as a professor at the U University of California, San Francisco, uh, before he moved to uh, EPFL uh, in 2009. Uh, I think many of uh, um, kind of uh, you know uh, uh, Dr. Hanahan as a, as a uh, co-author of Hallmarks of Cancer series, where first uh, um, paper was published uh, uh, in 2000 in, in the Journal of Cell, and, and then uh, and, and the second one, well, Hallmarks of Cancer, the next generation published 2011, and then now the uh, latest edition, Hallmarks of Cancer, New Dimensions, uh, was published just uh, this year uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Cancer Discovery. Uh, and it's, it's a great pleasure for us because Cancer Bias Summer School has been running about 15 years now and, 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 and every year um, the um, topics and sessions and have been built around uh, hallmarks of cancer and, uh, cancer and we've been trying to kind of uh, keep up with uh, all the new uh, additions. So it, it, it's, 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 it's really great for us to, to, to have you here as a guest uh, speaker this year. And, and just a quick practical thing is that uh, that the, uh, all of those following this uh, um, uh, seminar can type your questions to uh, uh, to chat, and and Mariel and Krista will take care of uh, of um, of uh, taking the questions. So without uh, any further ado, uh, uh, Doug, please. Okay, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, and. Uh, I, I will uh, try to give you some perspectives on not only the new dimensions that were published a few months ago, but just some broader issues, um, which I think are salient to thinking about the biology of cancer. So, um, you know, but the hallmarks of cancer came about, here. Uh, basically thinking about uh, sort of this conundrum of cancer, which is that as I think you've appreciated from your course, this is a disease of, of extraordinary complexity at all levels, genetic, histological, pathological, prognostic, therapeutic. And, and it's really daunting and, 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 and actually depressing uh, when, when, you, when you look at, when you dig in deep into just the, the breadth and, and complexity of, of cancer. And so the, the, the question arose that in a conversation, a series of conversations with Bob Weinberg and myself is can we rationalize this complexity? Are there common principles underlying this daunting diversity? And so we reason perhaps naively trying to simplify the complexity of cancer that perhaps cancers share fundamental qualities. And this daunting complexity merely reflects different solutions to the same challenge. It's just like if you're climbing a mountain that's never been climbed before, you could climb it 
from many different routes, from the north face, the south face, the east ridge, and that um, cancer cells, as we understand the biology of normal tissue homeostasis, it's evident that cancer cells must surmount barriers and roadblocks that are used by the organism to prevent expansive cell division um, and proliferation. But some of these uh, differ mechanistically from organ to organ and cell type to cell type, depending on uh, the, you know, their biology and what their requirements are for uh, uh, the potential to proliferate or not. And so we, we coined this, this notion of hallmarks of cancer, which we defined as, as acquired functional capabilities that allow tumors to perform functions uh, that contribute to the uh, this so-called outlaw organ uh, and, and the manifestation of the disease. And typically they conduct these actions chronically because cancer cells and, and tumors are not inventors. Uh, they don't create new biology. What they do is co-opt and corrupt what are normally carefully orchestrated tasks of cells and organs in the body. So these are these functional capabilities are all evident in development and homeostasis and wound repair and differing situations. And, and uh, they're, they're not new, uh, newly developed or just, uh, patented by cancers. They're rather uh, just uh, repurposed by and corrupted by cancer cells. So we pose the hypothesis that there were six and then eventually eight hallmarks of cancer that were necessary and sufficient for most forms of human cancer to arise. And, and these are, we believe are quasi distinctive um, capabilities um, and, uh, and which I will just walk you through uh, to, uh, by way of illustration. So the, the first hallmark is certainly is, you know, reflects the, the whole nature of the disease. It's not a degenerative disease, it's an expansive disease. And so sustaining proliferative signaling uh, is, is definitely a hallmark capability. I mean, the analogy is it's an accelerator. You drive the cell cycle uh, via signals and instruct cells to grow and divide chronically. But again, uh, part of, you know, the, the, con the flip side to to uh, stimulating the cell cycle are a series of checks and balances on cell cycling, uh, which is in, embodies the second hallmark of evading growth suppressors, namely uh, various cell intrinsic and paracrine uh, mechanisms for limiting cell growth. Because in most situations in normal homeostasis and in development, proliferation is transient. It comes on and then it turns off. And part of the turning off relates to, uh, you know, growth suppressors as well as uh, stimulators of cell proliferation. So both cell intrinsic and paracrine mechanisms can shut off um, and block cell division exist. And, and many of these are disabled in one way or another in different forms of cancer. The third hallmark of resisting cell death reflects another mechanism that's, that's a protective mechanism, which is really at a form of assisted suicide, that if cells are, uh, are, are become deranged or aberrant, um, they can trigger basically damage uh, signals, which can elicit um, the program, multiple mechanisms of programmed cell death that are in part intended to prolifer to prevent unauthorized proliferation <clears throat> and also to get rid of seriously damaged cells and the like. But there's a whole series of, of mechanisms of programmed cell death, including most prominently apoptosis, but also necroptosis and a series of variations on the theme. And these can be uh, demonstrably induced uh, during tumor genesis. And in many cases, uh, there, this capability is attenuated uh, or suppressed in, in uh, late stage tumors. The fourth hallmark re 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 reflects another uh, mechanism that's evolved to limit uh, the, the extent of proliferation of, of, of differentiated cells, and which we've, we've dubbed enabling replicative immortality, but it's embodied in the linear uh, structure of, of, of the chromosomes and the fact that at every cell division, uh, the, the chromosomes, because of the end replication problem, become slightly smaller, shorter. And there's a series of highly repetitive elements uh, called telomere repeats 
uh, at the end, which are uh, which um, when they when the numbers decrease to a, um, a, a, an insufficient level can trigger either cell cycle arrest or um, uh, or cell death. And so and so this is basically a counting mechanism uh, that blocks further cell division when a preset limit is reached. But cancer cells, uh, much like normal tissue stem cells, enable sort of re replicative immortality and avoid this, this uh, counting uh, checkpoint uh, by turning on the enzyme telomerase, which, which adds telomere repeats to the ends and therefore preserves the, uh, the, the lengths of the chromosomes beyond this uh, triggering uh, limitation for short telomeres. And there's another, there's other mechanisms involving recombination that are used in some circumstances. But, but again, you have to escape from uh, this, um, uh, this uh, attrition of the telomeres if you're gonna continue to grow prolifer uh, expansively. So these four hallmarks are all really embedded uh, in, the, in the cancer cells themselves. The fifth hallmark is inducing or assessing blood vasculature. It really relates to the realization that, that uh, nascent tumors um, need to be supplied uh, with a vasculature for oxygen and nutrients, much like normal tissues. And so, the, uh, and so it's been evident now from decades worth of research, uh, a, pro a principal method to do this is to turn on new blood vessel growth, uh, the so-called process of angiogenesis, but in addition, it's increasingly evident that you can also access va su sufficient vascularization to supply oxygen and nutrients um, and sustain lesional expansion by invading and co-opting normal tissue vessels. So really there's two complementary strategies that developing neoplasms use in order to get oxygen and nutrients to sustain expansive growth. The sixth hallmark is perhaps the most insidious and perplexing. It's, it's the capability for invading, um, uh, for, for activating invasion and metastasis. And so we're all the, the first five are all quite logical in terms of, uh, you know, of creating an, an, an expansive lesion. Uh, but, but the question is, why do cells invade and metastasize? And, and, um, and we think this is, again, just a Dar neo-Darwinian selection that, uh, that uh, cells that uh, the tumors can be uh, cells and tumors can be self-limited by just the bulk of the tumor, and if they if they switch into an invasive and metastatic phenotype, they can expand then uh, by growing by invading and and um, and migrating to normal organs, and and again by by vascular co-option and, and other mechanisms live off the fertile land of of healthy tissues. But it's still sort of an enigma but it's a very common quality of, of many forms of cancer. And there are many, many mechanisms of metastasis, but it's one of the most complex and perplexing, and of course, uh, a major determinant of mortality and morbidity. The seventh hallmark sort of came up between the first and so second iterations of the hallmarks conceptualization, with the realization that, um, that um, uh, tumors deregulated cellular energy metabolism. And uh, basically most cells either use oxidative phosphorylation or aerobic glycolysis, depending on their biology. Um, and, but, but cancer cells become in, in essence um, uh, flexible and they tap alternative energy sources to provide fuel for cell growth and also to produce the additional supplies of the cell cellular building blocks that are needed to generate new cancer cells. So. They're very much like modern automobile engines that are hybrid. These are, these are hybrid in, in their ability to utilize multiple sources uh, of, of fuel to, again, provide not only energy, but also the cellular constituents uh, to, uh, for continuing proliferation. And the eighth hallmark is avoiding immune destruction. I mean, the concept was, had been around for 60 years. Um, the idea that maybe the immune system uh, was surveying uh, tissues and um, and was therefore uh, attacking um, incipient neoplasias, but it, there was a lot of ups and downs to the field. But it's now with with the with the whole uh, revolution in, in understanding the regulation of the immune system, which I'm going to elaborate on in the second part of the talk. Um, it's, it's now evident that in many cases the immune system detects neoplasia 
and seeks at some point during tumor development and progression to kill cancer cells. And this is an attack that lethal tumors learn to circumvent by a variety of mechanisms. So that's the hypothesis then. Is that the, I think you can appreciate that each of these functional capabilities um, are quasi, are sort of distinctive in terms of, of their mechanism. And so it's easy to envision that they're collectively contributing to what we see in these outlaw organs we call tumors. And, and of course, and we'll come back to the end of uh, whether they're, the, this is fully explains tumors or not, but, uh, but these have, I think by the resilience of this complex it's, um, concept, it's been arguable that this is at least a foundation for thinking about um, uh, the, uh, the, the complexity of cancer and its rational underpinnings. So the other question that we, our concept that we posed was the acquisition of these hallmarks. Because the one thing is, is well, you know, these are functional capabilities, but how are they acquired? And, and, and so we dubbed these enabling characteristics. And the fundamental one that's been known again for 60 years is genome instability and mutation. That, um, that, that basically, um, you know, virtually all tumors, and we know this now by the ability to resequence entire human ge tumor genomes, that, that they're virtually all tumors have, uh, are not normal diploid cells. They've, they've suffered instability and have uh, developed mutations. And that, you know, again, with just the, the most obvious being oncogenes and tumor suppressors, which drive proliferation and take out the, um, uh, remove the, the breaks on proliferation. So it's, it's very clear now that, that tumors have varying numbers of mutations. Some of them are these driver mutations, others are passengers, but, but really this instability and mutation is a foundation of cancer. And, and arguably what, uh, this is a well, major reason for this is to convey uh, many, if not all of, of, of these hallmark capabilities. The other one, which was less obvious, which came up, um, which was starting to, to come on into, into focus in the, um, the late um, 90s and, and really uh, during the first decade of this um, century really came into clear focus. And that's the notion of tumor promoting inflammation that, um, that actually tumors um, are, are infiltrated with immune cells that are conveying hallmark capabilities. And that's something, again, I'm gonna come back to and discuss. So, so and, and again, you know, when I, when I was starting as a student and you went to a cancer meeting, virtually all of the major cancer meeting, virtually all the sessions focused on the cancer cells and, and their genetics. I mean, what kind of genes were being discovered and oncogenes and tumor suppressors and other modifiers. And, and, and you could imagine that a uh, tumor by based on these meetings was just, you know, was just really, uh, you know, a, a, a bag of cancer cells and that that was all that was important. But we've now really come to appreciate that tumors are assemblages of cell types that communicate and collaborate in the manifestation of the disease. And so this includes already, of course, the cancer cells, but now we appreciate that cancer cells also with the ability to do uh, single cell uh, sequencing and, and all sorts of other sophisticated um, uh, technologies um, that, that tumor cells are highly, uh, I and mean, most tumors are highly heterogeneous. And two major, the three major classes are illustrated here, which are sort of cancer cells within the bulk of a tumor, invasive and metastatic cancer cells that are migrating out of the tumor. And then this um, um, cell type, which is evident in some cancers and at varying frequency, so-called cancer stem cells, which seem to be slowly proliferating and to have um, even more qualities of uh, genuine tissue stem cells than their, their compatriot, their bulk of majority compatriots. And so this is again, exploded into a huge field of study. And, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's complicated because in some systems, cancer cells can, um, can produce, cancer, uh, cancer stem cells can produce uh, not quote unquote non-stem like cancer cells. But in some cases, uh, the, the non-cancer stem cells can, can switch into a more stem cell like phenotype. And so this is a whole area of the, this heterogeneity. And then this is just one simple manifestation or two simple manifestations of the heterogeneity 
that we're seeing now with, with this capability, both histologically with, um, with all these uh, imaging capabilities and, and also single cell sequencing. But in addition to that, then there are a series of cell types which are generically and fundamentally important. So there's the endothelial cells and pericytes of the tumor vasculature, which um, is either produced by angiogenesis or co-option, which supplies oxygen and nutrients and expels waste. In addition, that's long, there's been a long appreciated uh, cancer associated fibroblasts, although once upon a time they were thought to be, you know, just uh, boring passengers that were brought along from the ride because many it went when tumors invaded from the parenchyma in, into stromal tissue. But we now appreciate that cancer associated fibroblasts are a discrete set of cell types, some of which uh, really kind of functionally contribute to uh, tumor phenotypes. And then finally, there are tumor promoting inflammatory cells uh, embodied in that um, enabling characteristic that I first mentioned. And, and now in different in tumor, this is sort of generic to most tumors, but then there are in some tumors, there are special cells uh, that are also important, adipocytes, or, which are sort of a, a fibroblast related cell or are important in certain tumor types and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so, and the important thing is, even though I talked about the importance of gene mutation for conveying hallmark capabilities, it's clear that, that um, these stromal cells recruited in the tumor microenvironment can de demonstrably contribute to acquisition of, of seven of the eight hallmarks. And, and so this is pr principally evident from studying um, and, and mouse models of cancer but also some studies in human uh, and it's uh, and where it's really been documented that infiltrating immune cells, cancer associated fibroblasts and so-called angiogenic vascular cells, endothelial cells and pericytes can demonstrably contribute in different experimental systems to virtually all of these hallmarks, um, uh, sustaining proliferative signaling, deregulating cellular energetics, cell death, angiogenesis, invasion and metastasis, Avoiding, more avoiding immune destruction. Um, so the only hallmark which is not demonstrably uh, modulated by stromal cells is this uh, telomere counting mechanism intrinsic to the cancer cells themselves to enable replicative Im immortality. But importantly, these uh, the con contributions of stromer cells to acquiring these capabilities are not necessarily operative in every tumor type or at every stage of tumor development. I mean, some of these may convey hallmark capabilities during early neoplastic development, and then mutational um, uh, progression in the cancer cells uh, provides other um, really sustainable ways of, of, of conveying these hallmarks. So the hallmarks, the bottom line is that the hallmark capabilities may be modulated by genetic mutation, by accessory stromal, stromal cells, or by a mixture of both. Okay, so <clears throat> that is really the core conceptualization, most unusual collaboration between Bob Weinberg, who's a professor at the Whitehead Institute and, and MIT in Cambridge, Mass, USA. So having sort of laid the groundwork then with, with the concept, uh, I wanna, you know, present three reflections that are beyond this core conceptualization. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk about the immune dichotomy that's intrinsic to the hallmarks, just mention possible applications to cancer medicine, and then finish with uh, floating some trial balloons of provisional new facets to the conceptualization. Okay, so I want to really, because I think this is very important for those of you who are studying cancer and, and trying to understand tumors and the biology of tumors, is this dichotomy of tumor promoting and tumor antagonizing immune responses, which are intrinsic to the hallmarks capable of conceptualization. Now, as a prequel, just to reemphasize the obvious that we, you know, we're in the midst of the uh, of an exciting sort of breakthrough frontier in cancer of orchestrating the immune system to attack tumors. And, and again, you know, you know, immunotherapy, so there were 40 years and billions of dollars spent on, on really uh, attempts to, uh, to vaccinate uh, patients with tumors and to elicit immune attack, which were largely failures. 
they're largely failures because of uh, our, our, our incomplete knowledge of the regulation uh, of, of the immune system and of T cells in particular. But it's now become evident that, that we understand how to um, uh, but, you know, orchestrate and, and incentivize and stimulate uh, the, the attack of, of killer T cells on tumors. But again, because the, the, what, what we now appreciate, and this is also evident from the flip side of cancer or proliferative disease, are uh, you know, autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes, where T cells actually kill normal cells, uh, and, and that's a real problem. And so the immune system has is is evidently developed the capability to be turned on transiently and then shut back off. And this, of course, and, and then the transient nature of immune responses against tumor is has been largely inadequate to produce efficacious responses, but, but that now is changing <clears throat> because there have been exciting and enduring responses to immunotherapies. Uh, uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, you know, ar arising out of the Nobel Prize winning discovery of these, check of these immune checkpoints, PD-1 and CTLA-4, <clears throat> but also engineered T cells that are um, both CAR T cells and other forms of T cells that are engineered to be to specifically recognize cancer cells. And, and so these are, the, these are producing you know, exciting responses in certain cancer types. But the reality check is that only a subset of patients typically respond, and for many cancer types, few if any patients respond. And so why are the, the efficacious responses so inconsistent? And that's again, uh, I believe, is embedded in the immunobiology of tumor phenotypes embodied in cancer hallmarks. Because amongst the eight hallmark capabilities and two enabling characteristics, uh, two of them involve the immune system, avoiding immune destruction and tumor promoting inflammation. And that I call the immune dichotomy of cancer. Because on the one hand, tumors demonstrably restrict infiltration or killing activity of cells of the adaptive immune system. And that's really the fundamental basis for this hallmark capability to avoid immune destruction is that the, the two, what we see in successful symptomatic tumors is ones that have, have developed the capability to avoid immune destruction. But on the other hand, there's tumor promoting inflammation that tumors attract cells of the innate immune system to enable hallmark capabilities, including interestingly immunosuppression that some of these cells are demonstrably immunosuppressive. And so this is really uh, of course, um, uh, counterintuitive. So tumors are attracting cells of the innate immune system and restricting cells of the adaptive immune system. Yeah, so let's just talk about this. So my former student and colleague, uh, Garrett Christofori in Basel, uh, dubbed the, dubbed the inn innate immune system corrupted policemen and that they, 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 they really miss, you know, these are cells that, were, that have evolved to fight, you know, to, to heal wounds and fight infections, uh, and, but they clearly misdiagnose the problem uh, in, in neoplasias and tumors, and cells of the innate immune system infiltrate solid tumors and pre-malignant lesions where they contribute to multiple hallmark capabilities. Now, the, this roster of a tumor promoting innate immune cells is complex, dynamic, plastic, and imprecisely defined. But uh, 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 the most prominent uh, constituents are macrophages and neutrophils, uh, which have varying states, um, which have been dubbed M1 like and M2 like, which are really simple. Uh, but there's a whole spectrum of phenotypes, some of which are stable and some of which are really very, um, uh, very unstable. But macrophages and neutrophils, various immature myeloid progenitors, paralyzed and dysfunctional dendritic cells, and potentially mast cells, the eosinophils, basophils, et cetera. And so what are these cells doing? Well, they can contribute to multiple hallmark capabilities. So uh, and innate immune cells can stimulate cancer cell proliferation, induction of angiogenesis, facilitating invasion, supporting metastasis. In each case, there are you know, there's a variety of mechanisms that have been attributed to these capabilities. And, but interestingly, um, you know, a lot of this relates to what's going on tran transiently in wound healing, where you have stimulation of, of cell proliferation, you in induce angiogenesis, you facilitate uh, you know, migration, local migration, 
of cells that are that are filling and clearing the wound and, and etc. So there's a lot of biology there. And then, interestingly, as I mentioned already, the you know some of these innate immune cells actually contribute to the hallmark capability for avoiding immune destruction. For example, by suppressing cytotoxic T cells, the so-called myeloid-derived suppressor cells, or MDSC, or also these M2-like macrophages. And these cells all could also contribute to drug resistance, for example, protecting the vascular from antiangiogenic therapies. So these cells are definitely part of the problem. And then you've got the what Garrett referred to as the paralyzed policeman that that cytotoxic, which really uh, are, are underlie the um, the capability to avoid immune destruction. That these um, that CTLs are kept at bay by multiple mechanisms, which limit tumor immunity. Tumorcidal antigen presenting macrophages and neutrophils are reprogrammed into tumor promoting wound healing variants. Uh, tumorcidal macrophages are blocked from killing cancer cells directly, the so-called cells through CD47. And even B cells uh, can and have in some contexts been shown to promote tumor progression rather than contributing to anti-tumor immune responses. So yeah, there's uh, so in, in, you know the adaptive immune system is in general uh, you know taken out in the context of avoiding immune destruction. Okay, so, but that brings us then uh, to this um, you know, breakthrough where it's been possible to disrupt one of the mechanisms, I might emphasize, um, that enable the hallmark capability for avoiding immune destruction, and that's immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, which, are, which again are normally induced as part of this, as I mentioned, transitory, the deliberately transitory activity of cytotoxic T cells, that they're meant to come on for a brief period to fight infections and heal wounds and whatever, and then they're supposed to be turned back off. And one way they turn back off is by uh, activating these immune checkpoints, which basically stop their proliferation and cause their exhaustion and, and, and eventually dying. But again, uh, you know, drugs have been de developed now that target these two checkpoints, um, antibodies to CTLA-4 and PD-1 or it's like in PDL-1. So this has been, and this has produced uh, a breakthrough in that, for example, in metastatic melanoma, uh, which used to be a death sentence, a subset of patients are having enduring responses. Here's a, um, a trial for um, anti-CTLA-4 overall survival, and there's a flattening of the curve here where some patients are arguably cured. Here's another one overall survival with anti-PD-1. Uh, compared to standard of care chemotherapy, where the patients all die. And again, um, you know, patients are uh, living longer. Um, so that's really good. But, you know, everyone looks at the flattening of the curve. But and, you know, I think the important thing here is that above the flattened curve are a whole bunch of patients that are not either not responding or transiently responding, which are implications of adaptive or intrinsic resistance. So again, there were the, the reality check was everyone thought this was going to be curative and, and produce you know, just a revolution in cancer therapy, but it's now evident that there are adaptive and pre-existing uh, resistance mechanism to checkpoint inhibitor theories of uh, therapies, much as there are for conventional and targeted therapies. So again, that's a really fascinating study uh, area for investigation at the moment. And so I think one basis for this is really in, in the form of multiple diverse barriers to invasion and effective killing of tumors by the immune system. And now this is again, a, very, I mean, a huge area of investigation, but I think there's in principle three classes of barriers to successful immune mediated killing of cancer cells um, in, in order to produce eff efficacious therapeutic responses. So there, are, and there have been barriers that are demonstrably operative in the cancer cells themselves, in the physiologically self-limiting responses of cytotoxic T cells and their compatriots. There's not only the two checkpoint inhibitors that I described, but a dozen or so more other uh, sort of uh, checkpoint inhibitors and, and um, co-stimulatory molecules and, and so on and so forth that are all involved in physiologically self-limiting the activity of, of T cells. And then finally, the stromal cells of the tumor microenvironment that I've already alluded to. 
And so I think a necessity for more broadly and generally effective cancer immunotherapy is gonna be breaking down these barriers. And to that end, um, you know, I, I, I wanna go into part three, which is really to discuss how potential applications of this concept to cancer medicine. So I think arguably uh, when Bob Weinberg and I wrote this, we thought it was kind of interesting and, and worth maybe, you know, we had this conceptualization at a conference in Hawaii and thought, well, gee, this is kind of interesting. Maybe we should, we should um, put it you know, in together into some kind of a opinion piece. But we had no, no sense of destiny that, that this would have any uh, great uh, resonance in the community and when it was published. But obviously it was um, and, and has become, you know, as you've heard, um, in, uh, uh, of a, a structure for organizing courses all the way from uh, from uh, uh, you know um, uh, middle school to um, colleges and medical school and oncology schools, and as well as just um, uh, being widely cited. So obviously there has been some resonance to that, and so that's of course a very satisfying contribution. But the question, which is unanswered at the moment, which I've been in, you know, intrigued by, by for, for some years is whether this concept is applicable to the goal of more effectively treating human cancers. Now, importantly, we have a growing armamentarium of so-called smart drugs that can target each of the eight hallmarks and their enablers. And this is just a simplistic slide. There are, in many cases, dozens and dozens of, of different kinds of drugs that are targeting each of the eight hallmarks and or uh, their enabling characteristics, and there are drugs that target regulatory pathways that actually influence multiple hallmarks, which is, of course, another interesting opportunity. But um, I just want to reflect on the reality check of targeting single hallmarks, be whether it's an immune checkpoint or, or another one. And, and the example here, again, is metastatic melanoma. And so with the onset of targeted, because before immunotherapies came targeted therapies, and there was a, you know, 20 years ago, there was a great excitement that targeted therapies would be more precise, less toxic, and, uh, and less uh, prone to uh, the um, resistance that, that it was is so chronic with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And so here's an, one of the first uh, really classical prototypes of this. So one, about half of metastatic melanoma uh, develop uh, mutations in, a, in an oncogene BRAF, um, and a drug was developed, actually several, but the first one developed was memorafenib, uh, and, and BRAF was, is demonstrably important for targeting the proliferative hallmark. And so this is a, just an example of what we pro probably, we all dreamed about for cancer therapy. So here's a patient with metastatic melanoma treated with memorafenib, and in two weeks, metastatic disease melts away. I mean, the the, 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 the signal that's with this imaging technology that's, reserved, that's, that's observed here is really normal organs, but all of this uh, mass of, of metastasis um, has, has, has either shrunk or disappeared. And so this is what we dream about. But the reality check is six months later, multifocal metastatic disease is back with a vengeance and in fact, even more aggressive. And so this, this is the reality check in general with, with targeted therapies, uh, of, all, of, of all targeted therapies, is that cancers are, are, are mutable, they're adaptable, uh, it's a neo-Darwinian evolution, and, and, if, and because they're heterogeneous, as we're now appreciating even more heterogeneous than we'd ever imagined, uh, when you treat a tumor with something, there are probably in this BRAF-driven tumor, there's heterogeneous cancer cells that no longer depend on BRAF. And so again, you block BRAF and they come back because they're, 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 they're being driven by something else. So this is the reality. Now, so the dream scenario would be just to attack all of the hallmarks simultaneously to stop tumors dead in their tracks um, because we have this armamentarium. But uh, the reality check is that's almost certainly going to be a, a to too toxic as many even of these single uh, targets are, are quite toxic. But so I've kind of I postulated some years ago about a you know a sort of a, a another future of cancer therapy which involved rational combinations layers and sequences basically because the hail mary attack will certainly have too many side effects, but that's just illustrated here that if one takes mechanistically logical combinations um, uh, that that could synergize 
then maybe that would be a strategy to go forward. But even then you could imagine that, um, that even with uh, multi-targeting several hallmarks, you're gonna see eventual adaptive resistance come in, but then you could switch to another a hallmark co-targeting strategy. And so in this particular one here, we know and, uh, that, and I have helped contribute to this, is that angiogenesis inhib inhibition is transitory and prone to adaptive resistance. But one of the forms of resistance to antiangiogenic therapy involves activating invasion and, and metastasis. So, um, and to us, so as to co opt normal non angiogenic tissue vessels. So, you could imagine co targeting angiogenesis and invasion and metastasis. And, but we and all, all others have also shown that, that uh, cells with an impaired vasculature also modify their, their cellular metabolism. Uh, so uh, in a phenomenon we've called a meta metabolic symbiosis, and they start, for example, uh, feeding on lactate rather than uh, releasing it as, uh, as toxic waste. So anyway, there's a, there would be a rationale for targeting um, metabolism, angiogenesis, uh, and invasion of metastasis. But again, immune checkpoint in inhibitors uh, work for some people some of the time, but in other cases, probably these uh, adaptive resistance mechanisms are evident. And one of those, of course, is the tumor promoting inflammation. So if you can take out the myeloid derived suppressor cells and the M2 macrophages along with checkpoint inhibitors, that could be good. Some tumor, but then you want the tumor to be, if you can really get the, the CTLs coming in, you want it to be highly mutagenic. And actually, there are strategies now that people are considering to actually treat tumors with mutagenic chemotherapy to increase the load of neoantigens and make the tumor more immunogenic, more visible to the T cells that have been activated by uh, taking out these hallmarks. And, and again, uh, you know, one of the mechanisms of CTL killing is, is inducing apoptosis. So you could also suppress the capability to resist cell death. So these are just sort of, I think, logical combinations of a subset of these uh, 10 hallmarks and enabling characteristics. But even then, you know, it, it may be that, um, that the tumors are too smart and over time, any sort of co cocktail of combinations you throw at it, uh, there will be adaptive resistance, but you could foresee a future where you can, with, or particularly with early detection of relapse, that you could really switch from, from co combination to combination. So here again, this is started, you know, if you target, start targeting with the immunotherapy combination, you know, modulatory, you could then move on if you see incipient failure to target the oncogenic drivers, uh, invasion of metastasis, and 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 can and so on. And so perhaps this could be if we had early detection of relapse, such you didn't wait till there was progressive disease, symptomatic progressive disease. Maybe one could you know create this condition that's been oft discussed of cancer without disease, even if we can't completely eradicate the cancer, if we can keep it asymptomatic, um, then maybe that's an interesting possibility. Okay, so I'm just gonna now, in terms of the applications to human medicine, that's all speculative and yet to be tested. Um, but I just wanna give you an example with immune checkpoint inhibitors, because this is a, a, a you know, breakthrough thing and there's you know, dozens of pharmaceutical companies, all of whom have checkpoint inhibitors, and they're all trying to, and, and which aren't working most of the time for most um, uh, forms of human cancer. And so there are thousands of clinical trials going on, combining checkpoint inhibitors with anything and everything uh, that, that targets uh, one or another of these other hallmarks. And so this and so even though these were not the, the kind of logical designs that uh, one might hope for, though the reality is, is that Hallmark co-targeting is being tested with this anchor of checkpoint inhibitors followed by anything and everything. And so I'm just gonna give you um, a one sign of light, which involved us clinically, recently clinically approved trials that in, involve Hallmark co-targeting. And they involve co-targeting uh, uh, the um, the hallmark for a vas for vascularization and angiogenesis with uh, checkpoint inhibitors, and so for example, in all cases here, uh, going through all the details, a checkpoint inhibitor anti PDL one or anti PD one, when combined with drugs that target 
in particular, um, the VEGF pathway um, here with uh, an antibody, uh, bevacizumab, avastin, um, or a VEGF receptor tyrosine kinase uh, have been approved for um, patients with, un, uh, with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, metastatic non-small lung cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and endometrial cancer. And part of the rationale for this is that inhibiting the VEGF pathway does inhibit angiogenesis, but it also remodels the tumor vasculature and makes it more normal rot-like. And that seems to facilitate the formation of high endothelial venules and, and makes the, the vasculature more permissive uh, to the um, uh, transcytosis of, of, of T cells that are invading tumors. So again, for, so this is now a very interesting area now of, of combining uh, and, you know, the angiogenic hallmark with the immune uh, invasion hallmark in, in terms of doing that. And um, this is just another one of com combining, the, and there's a, there's a lot of going on now, but combining PD-L1, a checkpoint inhibitor with uh, a BRAF and MEK inhibitors in melanoma. And so they're saying this is another, again, this is approved. And so, so I think that this is another example of targeting the proliferative hallmark and uh, the, the immune evasion hallmark, again, in melanoma, where both of these drugs work, but, but not as uh, enduringly or broadly as, as one would imagine. But there's also a, a, a whole variety of combinations going on involving CDK4-6 inhibitors, BCL2, KRAS, um, and, and many of these are being combined with checkpoint inhibitors, but hopefully in the future, they'll also combine them with drugs that are co-targeting uh, other hallmarks. So the question is, you know, but I, I have to say that uh, the, the clinical approvals that I mentioned there without going into the details were encouraging, but, but were not, um, you know, not dramatic. And so they, there, there was increased survival, but not cures. And so I think, you know, the question is, can there be long-term benefit from co-targeting multiple cancer hallmarks? And, and so time will tell, because I think these studies are encouraging, but so far are not, not dramatic or enduring. But I believe that the concept of hallmark co-targeting could really uh, be, be an important um, strategy for the future. Okay, so now I'm just going to finish quickly uh, with the oft-asked question of, are there more facets to the hallmarks conceptualization? And so there are some emerging parameters that are demonstrably operative in certain cancers that might in the future be generalized sufficiently to be corp incorporated into the, the hallmarks of cancer 3.0. Because one of the, the metrics that Bob and I applied to the hallmarks conceptualization that it, that it had to be, re they had to be reasonably generic across the spectrum of human cancers and not, uh, you know, there are, there are case specific, not nice examples of very specific capabilities in particular forms of cancer, but we wanted to, to stick to the big picture. And so there, I'll just run you through one of the ones that I've posed to stimulate debate, discussion, and continuing experimental assessment. So the first one is unlocking phenotypic plasticity. And this is embedded in the, in the dramatic heterogeneity we're seeing in cancer cells um, you know, by single cell RNA sequencing and spatial transcriptomics, et cetera. But uh, there, you know, and arguably there's at least three you know, well-validated modes of phenotypic plasticity that are operative in cancer cells. Um, and, and they really all relate to the notion that, um, that cancer is in some sense preying either on progenitor cells or differentiated cells and differing uh, uh, cells of origin and differing tissues. And so in normal differentiation, progenitor cells obviously produce differentiated cells. But uh, three forms of phenotypic plasticity which have been documented, one, the first one involves dedifferentiation, where a differentiated cancer cell de-differentiates back uh, to a progenitor, to, to, to a, a, cell, a proliferating cell that has features of, of the progenitor that produced it. In other cases, it's been clearly documented that you can have blocked proliferation. So a progenitor cell is blocked from differentiating uh, into a differentiated cell and rather expands uh, aberrantly as a, a progenitor cell. 
And finally, there's an increasing appreciation, uh, particularly in drug resistance, but also in, in other such of, of, for example, of targeted therapies that, um, that you're gonna have trans differentiation where a progenitor cell or a differentiated cell trans differentiates into a completely different cell lineage. And, and that would be in particular to avoid lineage specific therapeutic targeting, for example, of and androgen receptors in prostate cancer. So these are all, all three of these have been documented. There may be other manifestations of phenotypic plasticity. So a second one is whether non-mutational epigenetic program is a discrete enabling capability. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, it's, you know, the whole field of epigenetics in cancer is, 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 is a big area right now, but the, era, the one that I'm particularly interested in is, is the notion of embryonic development and differentiation, learning and memory, et cetera, are all orchestrated by non-mutational epigenetic programming. So, uh, you know, we start off as a single cell and become highly complex organisms, largely without any um, mutational uh, programming. And although it's very clear now that, that many cancer cells mutate chromatin modifiers and therefore create epigenetic alterations uh, uh, in tumors, I think the evidence increasingly suggests that purely epigenetic mechanisms contribute to the aberrant activities of cancer cells and, and also to the genomically stable cells of a tissue microenvironment. For example, in, in a number of tumors, cancer-associated fibroblasts uh, are stably uh, reprogrammed, um, but there's no evidence for, for driving mutations for that reprogramming. So the notion, so I think there are two forms of epigenetic control of cancer. One of them is mutational epigenetic reprogramming, but arguably uh, this non-mutational epigenetic reprogramming is, an, is an, a, a discrete enabling capability because uh, Bob and I would argue that mutational reprogramming of epigenetic modifiers actually falls under the umbrella of the hallmark for genome mutation, uh, genome instability and mutation. And so that's really, it's just another manifestation, much like oncogenes and tumor suppressors, of uh, the, the genome instability hallmark. But whereas pure epigenetic reprogramming is something different. So anyway, that's, that's the hypothesis. Um, um, a third one, which has also, again, been an exploding area in recent years, is the notion uh, of the importance of the microbiome in, 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 in all differing kinds of physiology and disease. And, and increasingly, it's appreciated that polymorphic microbiomes uh, may be important in modulating tumor phenotypes. Now, the gut microbiome is variably and convincingly implicated as an alternatively protective or tumor-promoting um, phenomenon, um, very clear now and, and that, uh, that again, different individuals, even in humans and in mice, can have microbiomes that are protective uh, or tumor promoting. Um, and, uh, you know, but not only is the gut microbiome on the radar, but so are epidermal and mucosal microbiomes, which in some cases are quite distinguishable from the gut microbiome. And, and also um, there are in some cases now are really nice case studies on intratumoral microbiomes modulating tumor phenotypes. So basically, it, you know, the, the, this is a new frontier, but uh, all these, you know, the gut, the skin, the vaginal cervical canal, the tumors, and oral cavity, lung, and others all have, are having their microbiomes um, uh, profiled in different individuals and in different disease states. And it's, it's evident that all, that all of these can contribute to modulating tumor growth, inflammation, immune evasion, genome instability, and therapy resistance. So it's a very complex variable, but I think one that's, that's gonna be um, 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 truly important for understanding uh, cancer in the broader context. And then finally, uh, you know, the, uh, the question is, are senescent cells important constituents of a tumor microenvironment? I presented these core uh, cells, but um, cells are senescing all the time in tumors, not only from cancer cells, but from stromal cells. And so are they, are they really uh, involved? Well, uh, basically, senescent cells activate this senescence-associated secretory program, or SASP. And this has potent capabilities to alternately promote or antagonize tumor development and progression. And so you can see senescent cells in differing tissues and in differing tumor types 
uh, varying between individuals. Some individuals have uh, senescent cells that are tumor promoting and others uh, tumor antagonizing, even in the same tumor type or tissue type. I mean, the, the, can the senescent cancer cells have been the most well documented, but other cells in the tissue microenvironment, including calves and endothelial cells, have been functionally implicated in case studies. And so arguably, when we're thinking about uh, you know, cells that are functionally important for hallmark capabilities, um, that arguably senescent cells may be part of that equation. So these are, you know, as, as mentioned, I published this uh, opinion piece, uh, trial balloons earlier this year in cancer discovery to really, uh, you know, suggest that an unlocking phenotypic plasticity is a new uh, emerging hallmark and that non-mutational epigenetic reprogramming and polymorphic microbiomes are, are sort of uh, incipient or, or provisional enabling characteristics and that senescent cells are part of uh, the roster of important cells populating the tumor microenvironment. And then finally, one thing that was not discussed in this review, which my lab is actually personally working on, but it just, it did, it, it, there was, it seemed to me there wasn't enough clarity to try to crystallize it in this short review. And that is cancer neurobiology, uh, which I think is a provisional new parameter way beyond the core. Uh, and, and, and because it's increasingly appreciated that the engagement of the nerves, nervous system and its signaling circuits uh, can be instrumental in cancer hallmarks. So here's a nice paper from Michelle Maggi, which is really showing uh, that, uh, that nerves are, are modulating, in this case, um, uh, the phenotype of gliomas. And my lab, for example, showed that, um, that um, metastatic breast cancer cells to the brain actually supplant astrocytes uh, so as to uh, receive uh, glutamate secreted during synaptic transmission to drive uh, the, the uh, proliferation and, and expansion of brain metastasis via the NMDA receptors that are induced in many cancer cells. So neural, neuronal signal, signaling circuits or neur and neurons themselves may be another um, really uh, new parameter of, of cancer that we're gonna hear a lot about in the coming decade. So I'll stop that on that note and thank you.